Testing, testing. Hello, everybody. Please have a seat so we can start the show. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Sit um, here. Sit somewhere that you see an agenda. Okay. All right, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just sit up there for now. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Tell me, this microphone's already dead. Can you hear me okay? Ah, there we go. There it is. I am obviously not Russell Redding. Uh, he is uh, still somewhere downstairs with uh, Ambassador Doug McCaleb who came to visit from the U.S. Trade Representative Office today. Uh, they're, they're talking about export opportunities, and hopefully in another couple of years we'll be talking about export opportunities for organics. Uh, yeah, just keep building, right? Every, every year we build something else in. This is the 20th anniversary of the department's Pennsylvania Preferred Program, which, among other things, among other things means I'm getting damned old. Yeah. <laughs> what it means. You look good, Cheryl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks, good. thanks, buddy. I, I remember vividly being down in the Susquehanna room cutting the cake for the PA Preferred Program and thinking, oh, please, <laughs> oh, please last, oh, please work. And 20 years later, we're still standing. And, and this year, the General Assembly not only continued to give us funding for the PA Preferred Program, which is awesome, uh, they also authorized, for the first time, a PA Preferred Organic uh, logo, which is, which is, I think, an important recognition of how far we've come in, in this space, too. Um, I know a lot of you have heard my story, but um, please bear with me. Uh, I have an uncle. I'm from New Jersey originally. I don't know how many of you know that. I'm from Bergen County, New Jersey, where the other side of the George Washington Bridge comes down. I uh, came out here to go to college and fell in love with the whole elbow space thing and, and, and stayed. Uh, but in central New Jersey, my grandparents had a nursery and greenhouse operation, and my uncle uh, left for Vietnam, uh, steak-eating, motorcycle-racing, all-American guy, uh, came home after how many years with Agent Orange and all the other things they were doing in Vietnam. He came home vegan and unwilling to eat anything he hadn't grown himself. Uh, so he, my grandmother left the nursery greenhouse business. My grandfather decided they were both crazy and moved to Maine. Uh, but they terraced the backyard of their New Jersey home, and I think the neighbors got concerned when the first dump truck load of manure came. Uh, but in about eight months, they were all kind of into it because all this good stuff kept showing up. There's tomatoes everywhere. There's, you know, they, they were growing everything they ate, which was no small trick in, in 1972. Uh, so part of my long-standing appreciation for Rodale was uh, my grandmother uh, reading everything that J.I. Rodale had put out by then, uh, trying to figure out how to do this thing to keep her son going. He had bicycled his way to Arizona and back to find himself, and she was just determined that nobody called it PTSD. In those days, we didn't know what it was, but organic farming saved that family. Uh, and freaked out my mother, who, <laughs> who used to make my dad stop at the Dairy Queen on the way home every time we went to visit them because her children needed meat and milk. And uh, we weren't going to get that at Grandma's house. So it's been, it's been part of my agriculture story for going on over 40 years now. And it's, it's obvious that Pennsylvania consumers are buying organic and want to buy more organic. And so really the only question is from whom? We know how to do stuff in agriculture in Pennsylvania. We know how to meet demand, right? And isn't it nice to be growing and producing to meet what we know is existing consumer demand and growing consumer demand? And not just, this is what grandpa produced and what great grandpa produced and you should buy it because I have it and we're gonna just try to keep going in the same rut we've been in for, for 40 years. This is an exciting growth area. It has been, it's really taking off uh, credit to uh, all of you for being in the room. I assume you all know each other. Is that true? <laughs> Is there anybody who doesn't know everybody else who's sitting in here? Mike, you, you don't know? I, I don't either, to be honest with you. Yeah. Kelly, can, can, are you going to do that? Never mind. <laughs> so, 
I will turn it over to our professional. We have a full-time, all-day, every-day organic coordinator at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. How about that? That is, uh, that is an advance over the days when some of us felt like we had to wear bags over our heads if we were going to a meeting about or organic agriculture. It's, it, it's, a, it's a big step forward, and I should just stop talking and turn it over to her, because <laughs> I'm getting a little tired after five days of this. Uh, Kristen, come on over here. Take, take over for me. You all know here. Kristen, right? Everybody knows Kristen? Hello, everybody. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, an, exciting, an exciting year with a new PA Preferred Organic Program and an Organic Center of Excellence in the, in the new budget. It is. Thank you so much, Cheryl. All right. Welcome again. I'm Kristen Markley, in case you don't know me. I'm the Organic Initiative Manager for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And um, there's, uh, I've been in this field for a long time, and um, it's just so exciting to me to see how much support there is, and you know, first of all, just acknowledgement, and then, of course, support, and continuing support into the future for organic agriculture. I've, you know, I um, started to talk with uh, you know, many of the advocates in this room you know, decades ago ab about these issues, and uh, we did sometimes feel like we needed to have a bag over our head, but um, it's no longer the case. We have a Department of Agriculture that I'm so honored to work for. The department prioritizes sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, food security, building racial equity within the food system. I am just really, really honored to work for this Department of Agriculture and, and grateful to be here with all of you and very grateful to our speakers. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun today. So um, yeah, Cheryl talked a bit about kind of the future for uh, PDA, that's Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, the future for PDA in terms of organic. Uh, what we're doing currently includes we administer the organic cost share certification program. We partner with both Rodell, why don't you raise your hands, Rodell Institute, and Team Ag, raise your, your hands. We uh, work with both of these organizations on offering free technical assistance to producers and processors who want to start or transition to organic and that's um that's a pretty huge lift that these partner organizations are doing and and offering just incredible expertise in walking producers and processors through that entire process it's a a huge lift and um an invaluable service we also partner with penn state extension can you raise your hands um and penn state university uh, with Penn State Extension, we're partnering with them on offering peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities for producers that are interested or currently are certified organic. And we're starting up organic, they're called organic study circles, and we're starting them up in different parts of the state for different types of operations. And those are just a really rich, you know, meaningful conversations between producers who, you know, probably learn the most from other producers and we need more opportunities for producers to be able to talk to each other and, and learn from each other. Uh, we fund a lot of Pennsylvania specific organic research and um, most recently we partnered with eConsult Solutions on an economic analysis of the impact of organic agriculture on Pennsylvania and you're going to be hearing about that today. Um, so just to give you a feel for the wealth in the room, um, I wish we had time to do, to do introductions. Um, next year, maybe we will have time to do that. Um, on your, if you have your, hopefully you have an agenda in front of you to see what we have for uh, today's program. On the back is an evaluation, and I really want you to fill that out, um, especially the last question, you know, what would you like to see next year? What should we do next year? What would be meaningful to you and your work and to the producers and processors we're supporting? So write down, you know, use a pen, write down your ideas um, at the bottom there. And if you think of any ideas afterwards, send me an email. So let's see, why don't just folks raise their hands um, so we know who you are. Okay, Chris Pierce with Heritage Poultry Management Systems. See where there you are. There you are. Okay, um, 
let's see, Ma Matt Hahn with Organic Valley, Georgia Plieger, hopefully I'm saying it right, Co sorry, Co Cooperative Organic Valley, Mark Taylor, the Organic Snack Company, Kelly Kondratic with Team PA, and Sarah and Andrea with Pasta Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, let's see, uh, Diana Cobus with PCO, Brian Moyer, Penn State Extension, Megan Shawner, Penn State Extension, Mary Barbercheck with Penn State University, Sage Dennis with Rodell, Dr. Arash Gale with Rodell, Sam Malurite with Rodell, and Maria Pop with Rodell, Andy Bader, member of Board of Directors of Pennsylvania Farm Bureau, Peggy Fogarty, Team Ag, Leslie Zook, Team Ag, Sue Ellen Johnson, Team Ag, Rich, is it Galusha with Penn Ag Industries? Fantastic. Katie McLaughlin with the Office of the Governor in the back there. We have Ashley Fair, who's the Director of Market Development for PDA. And uh, we also have the USDA National Organic Program. We have Emily, Penny, and Rebecca. Okay, who did I miss? Who did I miss? Jeff Warner. Can you say your name? Hello, I'm Jeff Warner with the Department of Agriculture Bureau of Food Safety. Thanks for being here, Jeff. Anyone else that I missed? We are recording this session today, so that's why we're speaking into microphones. Okay. Michelle Terquino, also here with Katie McLaughlin from the Governor's Office, OTO. Fantastic, thank you. Adia Effiong with PASA Sustainable Agriculture. Thank you so much. Oh, your mom. Oh, yes, please introduce yourself. I'm Dr. Deborah Stolbarth, and I'm Chris's mom. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and I'm going to introduce the speakers. So let me get to that. Um, we also, we do have the room reserved until 3.30, so please stay afterwards to network, okay, because we're going to be tight for time with what we're trying to cover. Okay, we have Gina Lavery. Lavery, I was like, wait a minute, I got to make sure I know how to say your last name. Gina Lavery with eConsult Solutions. Gina is a senior vice president and principal at eConsult Solutions, where she leads the firm's economic development practice area. At ESI, she leads engagements focused on equitable economic growth strategies and quantifying the economic impacts of various public policy initiatives. Next up, we have Haley. Haley is a PA preferred member the paint, with the Painterland Sisters. Haley is, uh, is co-CEO, co-founder of Painterland Sisters, an organic skier yogurt brand, a fourth generation organic dairy farmer. Haley Painter has set out to sustain her family's farm as well as other family farms for generations to come. Haley and her sister Stephanie have propelled Painterland Sisters to achieve $1.3 million in sales within the initial 12 months of business, expanding its presence to over 2,000 locations across 49 states. And Haley has donated some yogurt that I see some of you have found and um, others can, can grab after uh, after the program's over. <laughs> Thank you for that, Haley. All right, and next up we have Krista Barfield from Farmer John. Krista is the founder and CEO of Farmer John, which is a 128 working farm, 28, I'm sorry, 128 acre working farm, building a model that enables regenerative organic food production by and for underserved communities. Farmer John provides access to fresh organic foods within food deserts and the community at large through their storefronts. Krista is a Generation Change Fellow 
Philadelphia's community wellness leader and is recognized as a food is medicine and nutrition security champion by the USDA. And we have De Dean James, who's with Cotner Farms. Dean James is a farm manager for Don Cotner Farms in Danville. Cotner Farms is a century farm consisting of approximately 1,350 acres. They grow corn, soybeans, hay, wheat, and sunflowers. They have 200 acres that are certified or transitioning to organic. So many thanks to all of you for being here to share your valuable experiences and knowledge. Really grateful to have you. And grateful to all of you who are here. Um, as we know, there's a wealth of knowledge and experience in this audience. So feel free to stay afterwards. And um, remember to fill out your evaluation to inform what you want to see here next year. All right, I'm turning it over to Gina now. Thank you. All right, thanks Kristen and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Kristen introduced me already, I'm Gina Lavery. I'm a Senior Vice President at eConsult Solutions. Um, the agenda you guys have in front of you, so I don't need to, to go over. Maybe uh, we'll see the secretary towards the end if we're, if we're lucky. Um, so just to start things off, um, my firm eConsult Solutions, we're a consulting firm, does work throughout Pennsylvania at the intersection of economics and public policy. Much of our work focuses on economic development, strategic planning, and sometimes tax policy, which I try to stay away from personally. Um, but ESI has completed two previous studies for, e for PDA, looking at the impact of the agriculture and industry overall throughout Pennsylvania, as well as opportunities and the outlook for the industry and strategic recommend recommendations to advance the growth um, of the industry. That was in 2017 and 2020. Um, so we started working with PDA um, probably about a year ago, a little bit more, um, to examine the impact of organic agriculture in the state. Um, so we're really excited to give you um, an advanced look at some of the results. Some of you have probably seen the report and given some feedback already. Um, so I'm going to dive right in, talk a little bit about the um, economic metrics that we've um, that are in the report. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, market dynamics, opportunities, and threats, and some preliminary recommendations. But to be totally honest, um, all of you in this room and our wonderful panelists are all really the experts, and we want to hear from all of you around opportunities and market dynamics. So I'll talk about what we found in our report, but most of that is from conversations with everybody in the room. Um, so it is, and it's probably like, yeah, we know all of this. Um, so I'm going to stick to the part that I know best, which is the economic metrics. So let's see. Um, just to start off, um, we obviously, there's a, there's a strong foundation of um, and history and rich history of uh, organic farming in Pennsylvania. So one of the things we just do in the beginning of the report is kind of start off with that foundation. This is really, you know, going back beyond um, Rodale into, um, into previously indigenous farming communities. So we want to acknowledge that um, up until the, and then up until the present, there's a lot of um, kind of work that the um, Commonwealth is doing to support organic agriculture today, and I think you can see that um, in the remarks that um, um, Deputy Secretary Cheryl Cook gave, you know, the kind of growth of the industry uh, over, over time. Um, so I'll start with talking through a couple of highlights um, from, from our report that brings us um, to today. One thing I'll note is that the metrics in, um, that we're showing here are all from, primarily from 2020 from the end of 2021 from the USDA um, Agriculture Survey um, and, and from some other sources. That, that report was published in December 2022, so you think about any time when we do these economic reports, there's always like a lag time in how we kind of, when we get the data, when, how we process it and analyze it and then um, present it to all of you. So um, still relevant in the, in the kind of directional um, story that we're telling is, is one of kind of a growing industry and one that's, that's really strong and a part of Pennsylvania's overall economic competitiveness um, for years to come. So what we saw in, in the report that, we've, um, that we're have that we producing for PDA is um, around a little over $1 billion in uh, organic um, sales, and that's um, um, specifically um, farm commodities. We weren't able to, in this report, um, due to lack of data, look at um, um, processed products. So this is primarily the farm commodities themselves. Um, 
but this is still a really impressive number, and I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about where that um, where Pennsylvania stands uh, in terms of growth. You can see on the slide that um, <clears throat> as of this report, they were third in this, um, the Commonwealth's third in the U.S. Um, on this metric. Um, over 104,000 organic acres in Pennsylvania um, spread across 1,267 uh, certified organic farms, which is fourth in the U.S. Um, and then something that I find really impressive is just the overall um, annual growth rate. So 8.7 percent, that's uh, showing that the sales from year to year are growing pretty significantly. And if you think about a lot of people talk about um, inflation or, or things like that, this is far kind of outpacing anything like that. This is really about um, increased interest and demand for organic sales. It's, it's outside of anything related to other um, dynamics in the market. So I'll talk a little bit about um, economic impact. Um, this is um, the thing that I do for a living on a day-to-day -day basis. I will try to explain it um, in total, in um, in kind of some some basic terms. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to um, follow up during the Q and A or um, come up and 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 talk with me afterwards. I'm happy to um, go into more detail about what these economic impact metrics really mean. So first, um, notably. Um, Pennsylvania has seen a surge in organic agriculture, um, as I'm sure that you all are kind of noticing, um, this growth of 167% increase in total organic farms in Pennsylvania is uh, outpacing uh, the U.S. as a whole. Uh, and then really dramatically is the increase in um, overall sales of organic products, 789% uh, 700, is kind of like a crazy number to even like. Um, um, to even quote, but I double checked last night while I was preparing, so I'm 100% sure that's right, uh, over the last decade. So that's really dramatic increase in the overall demand for uh, organic products in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then the other st statistic that I think is really um, important for everybody to kind of keep in the back of their minds is um, Pennsylvania's share of the overall organic um, sales within the U.S. is 9.8%, nearly 10%. Um, that's up from just under four, three and a half percent, a ten years ago. So that means that as um, demand for um, organic products is growing nationally, it's growing more in Pennsylvania, which is really important to keep in mind and think about um, in terms of the state's um, overall competitiveness and um, and plans for the future. So one thing that we like to do when we talk about economic impact is we um, look at the total sales that are, um, or and when we call that direct output um, in in Pennsylvania. So 1.09 billion dollars in organic sales. Um, you can see on the screen the breakdown of what that means in terms of um, animal products um, compared to. Um, 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 fruits and vegetables. Uh, we have in our report a lot more um, detailed breakdown of what that means um, looking at um, everything from eggs, chickens, uh, mushrooms, different types of fruits and vegetables as well. So when uh, we finally publish the report, you'll be able to kind of get a little more insight into what that breakdown is. But we take that um, $1 billion, which is a huge number, um, in direct output is what we call it in economic impact modeling. Um, and that spending then um, spills over into other industries within Pennsylvania. Um, so what we look at when we talk about economic impact is you have your spending that, that is associated with organic products, and it um, generates indirect and induced outputs. Indirect output is um, related to the supply chain. So any time that, um, that a farm is then perhaps I, I always have to like think of like interesting examples on the spot. Uh, if you're, you know, even if, so, if you're buying, um, um, say, I just saw gloves when I was walking through. If you're buying gloves for your um, for 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 work that you're doing on your farm, that's an indirect um, output that's that's being generated, supporting um, you know a re the retail sector uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then on the induced output side, what we're talking about there is labor income. So the um, uh, the income that is um, that's generated and supporting workers on the farms, they're then spending money on um, food, uh, beverage, housing, healthcare. All of that is the spillover impact associated with um, with um, the industry's 1.09 billion dollars. So in total, that's 1.1 billion dollars in indirect and induced 
output that's in addition to and, and related to the um, organic agriculture industry. In total, that also is supporting almost $300 million in uh, employee compensation. We, we call it employee compensation because it includes um, um, wages as well as any kind of benefits that are associated um, with it and supports 7,100 jobs. Um, so when we talk about jobs and economic impact, we're talking about the direct jobs like on the farms themselves, but then also all of the um, um, jobs in these other um, sectors that are that are that have spilled over and are supported in in the economy. So goods and services, vendors, um, other ancillary services. So when you talk about the economic impact of organic agriculture in Pennsylvania, it's over two billion dollars um, as of the 2021 data that we received. So that's very significant, dramatic numbers. Um, I get desensitized when I do these presentations because I talk in billions of dollars, but it's really a, um, really remarkable and, and notable as, as, as we've kind of seen the increase in overall sales in Pennsylvania. So it's a, it's a um, kind of growing industry and one that, as we can all see, PDA is kind of helping support um, in the, over, um, over the last many years. So diving into um, current market trends uh, really briefly. In our report, we talk through um, two sides of market dynamics, supply and demand. I actually should have said them the other way because I think I talk about demand first. But demand uh, is obviously coming from consumers. Uh, what are the kind of forces that are impacting um, how, pe how people are um, purchasing or how, how they're deciding to um, spend their dollars on, on consumer goods? And then uh, supply is obviously related to the supply chain and, and things that are impacting how, um, how um, um, in this case, organic products are, are produced. Um, so over the last 10 years, um, we can see that um, just from the numbers that the, the, the growth of the organic agriculture sector has outpaced conventional um, agriculture. Um, we'll, we have a lot of really nice charts in our report that we'll, um, that we'll be sharing uh, in the coming months um, that kind of highlight the the trajectory of organic compared to conventional, and it's really just significant that um, that the industry continues to be able to um, grow at that rate. Um, despite that growth, all of you, because I'm obviously talking very positively, all of you know about the challenges that are that also re remain in um, in supporting the organic agriculture sector, and those come from both supply and demand sides. And I'll talk about these really quickly because I think um, our panelists will have some other insights into these as well. Um, first and foremost, look, okay. So first and foremost is um, around uh, high costs. Um, so as as we all know, um, organic products um, often cost more. Although the cost gap between organic and conventional goods is actually um, um, decreasing uh, over over the last several years. But what we're seeing is, um, you know, consumers are still at the end of the day thinking about, am I going to pay X dollars more for this product? And if they don't understand um, why they why they might um, why it might be a better um, product to spend more money on, they they may end up kind of deciding on the lower cost option. Um, that gets into the other two. Um, challenges around the demand side, which are consumer confidence. So that goes into um, labeling and certification and, and testing, something that uh, PDA is um, working to address. Uh, and also just general misconce misconceptions, um, so not understanding uh, what, what different labels mean. Um, so three kind of like big challenges that, uh, that, that the sector faces. Uh, the good news is these are all you know, addressable. A lot of them are around consumer education um, and and other strategies that can kind of help combat some of these um, these issues. Uh, there's also <clears throat> obviously a number of supply side barriers, um, uh, and as I as I've been saying, you all are aware of these. Um, in particular, um, regulatory hurdles and and costs associated with certification and transition remain. Um, um, at the top of um, farmers' minds in, in in various surveys that we've that we've researched, the statistics on this slide, specifically the 61% of Pennsylvania farmers um, citing some concern with regulatory problems, comes from the 2021 uh, USDA organic uh, survey that was that I've that I've referenced. Um, 
regulatory problems is pretty pretty vague and I dug into like what does that actually mean and it's around paperwork and I mean it's it was um it's a catch-all term I think that there could be additional research done in the future as to like what are what are those actual regulatory problems and how you know how acute are certain ones versus others but this was um kind of like the 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 this is the research to date on this topic um Another challenge with high costs and certification challenges is obviously a lot of organic farms are, are you know, when there are small operators, the, the kind of costs to um, do certain things impact them more. So the flux, so any kind of like fluctuations in, in costs are going to be more um, smaller operators are going to be more sensitive to, to those issues. Uh, again, a lot of these are things that PDA can help um, can help address and are thinking about. So something for us to all chew on and talk about during the um, Q and A session, as well. Um, and we have a slew of additional supply side challenges that um, that are obviously kind of. Um, <clears throat> top of all of your minds. We um, when we worked on this study over the last year, we. Um, did a lot of desk research is what we call it, you know, a lot of pulling data from the USDA and the organic integrity database. Uh, but we also had a lot of conversations starting with last year's farm show, uh, talking to um, maybe some of you that was I wasn't there here last year, but maybe some of you. So, um, and we've also talked over the last year with a number of, of, of farmers to kind of get insights into some of these supply side factors. So all of these are, are additional challenges that um, need to kind of um, plan for and 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 strategize on um, in the years to come. So future forces um, is a piece of our report where we are looking at um, what are the issues that are kind of going to drive the market in the years to come. Uh, and there's three overarching categories that we um, that we focused on. The one is around climate change, another is around equitable economic growth, and the third being research and innovation. Um, these are all kind of key areas, key buckets where um, the, the industry will, um, and the, and this isn't necessarily um, unique to organic agriculture. This is this is the agriculture sector in general are, will all be sensitive to in the years to come. Um, so we'll hear from the panelists a little bit more about their outlook, and and I hope that they might comment on on these future forces as we um, as we get into them. Also, um, the first is uh, is around climate change, and um, obviously the the one um, kind of benefit of organic farming practices is around the focus on soil health and how um, those um, how all of um, those kind of those approaches that are um, are kind of um, creating a positive feedback loop that ultimately is um, impactful and supportive of mitigating climate change. Although obviously there are a lot of kind of bigger picture issues that the entire agriculture faces in 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 light of um, climate change. The third cat, the second category is equitable economic development. Um, as Pennsylvania's ag organic agriculture sector grows, and as we've talked, as I've talked about, um, the sector has grown significantly in the last 10 years. This is an opportunity to enhance um, all of like communities across Pennsylvania. Thinking about where can um, where can the state and where can PDA kind of think about um, supporting um, land acquisition, whether it's um, leasing or purchasing, of making it available for for um, for and, and and providing educational opportunities to create um, pathways for um, equitable growth in in all of Pennsylvania's communities. Um, and the third um, opportunity, and I'll tell you all that my background is in um, is before before working at ESI is in. Um, working at a university so I think a lot of times about like the the importance of research and innovation in any kind of sector and I think that as we um, as we look to the future research and technology supporting organic agriculture is is very um, is very important and um, the organic center for uh, of excellence that has been funded this past uh, budget cycle is kind of a piece of that and will serve as an opportunity to think of how to um, how to advance uh, transitioning from conventional to organic um, as 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 can be done, and 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 figuring out how to um, how to enable that in in cost efficient and 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 smoother ways. So what's next? 
Um, based on all of our research, our conversations with a lot of you and other and your uh, colleagues um, across the the state, we developed a. a a bunch of recommendations for PDA to consider. Um, these are all in our report, and there's actually there's some additional ones that we're that we're fleshing out as well. Um, I I'd say I'd, we'd welcome your kind of thoughts, opinions on these either um, during this session or um, as a follow up. So um, just things for PDA to consider and, and serve as a launch pad for planning in in the years to come to support the organic um, agriculture sector. Um, I think today's panelists again they're we're, and, and all of you will kind of help, kind of provide us opportunities to uh, illuminate opportunities for these um, strategies and tactics. Um, we have we've kind of organized these into two buckets again around demand supports and supply, um, just to kind of think about how to address these um, address the challenges that we've that we've um, recognized. Um, so whether that's consumer um, edu uh, education campaigns or exploring if there's opportunities to um, to use um, CSAs as a as a launch pad for 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 kind of increasing demand in different communities, all of these are um, kind of ideas for um, further um, exploration um, in in the years to come. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn um, turn this discussion over to our our esteemed panelists and and Kristen, who will be leading some initial questions, and then hope to hear from all of you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. So yeah, if you have questions for Gina or ideas you want to send to me, please you know make note of them. My business card is up here on the front table if you don't have my email. But we'd love to hear from you regarding especially some of the potential recommendations that eConsult presented. So we're just going to transition into hearing from our esteemed panelists here, and then um, we'll have times for <coughs> questions and answers and discussions. So I just wanted to um, get started with asking each of you if you can tell us a little bit about your story and what brought you to use organic production practices. So who would like to start? Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Haley. I can start. Um, hi, I'm Haley Painter with Painterland Sisters. We are fourth generation organic dairy farmers up in northern PA in Tioga County. Usually people are used to hearing Potter in Tioga. It's because we're really deprived up there that we just get lumped in with another county. Um, and so we, we grew up there with you know, fourth generation, 13 cousins running around this farm. We didn't know we were poor, but yes, we were poor. <laughs> um, we were so rich because we had the opportunity to work with family, to work with the land, to work with animals, to work with community. We didn't have these boundaries of what structure was, which is actually more empowering than I ever thought I you know, had when I was a little girl. And as we were running around the farm, we'd go to school and we, we felt, you know, not comparable sometimes because we didn't have the fanciest shoes. We never had snacks. Like, we just had garden stuff and canned goods um, from the garden. And as we got out into college and going out, out into the world, we came back and we realized different things were happening. Like, our milk might not have gotten picked up or we weren't getting paid or it started getting dumped. Like, there, these were things that started to happen. In the early 2000s, farmers were getting accused a lot of um, bad practices with animal husbandry. So seeing all of this, and that gets, I never wanted to come back to the farm because I didn't want to milk cows. I just wanted to be, you know, there. As I got out into the world, I realized that we needed to be that voice for the farm, for our farm, or we'd be at risk of going out of business. Um, we put all that energy into it just to, you know, have an unstable market, to not be paid well enough, um, and to not sh be sure if we were going to be in business the next year and to have our cows. So my sister and I went to college. We traveled a lot. We got to meet people from all walks of life. And the biggest thing is people were very misconceived of where their far wh what a farmer was, all these different notions that we heard. And so um, instead of going down all the different paths, how we could come back to the farm, we knew we needed to 
create a market so we could provide sustainability for our farm for generations. And then all of our other wild ideas could come. And so we started studying what product can we launch that could really stabilize this farm. And after starting with that question, we realized if we stabilize our farm, that's fine and dandy, but we have to stabilize the other farms in our area so that we can be strong enough to really support these other infrastructures um, like the feed mills and um, the other things up north that we really need. And so we um, studied cheese making, we designed a processing plant. If we built a processing plant, then we'd be focused processing instead of really creating that brand and that market, which is extremely important. So we started a organic skier yogurt because we truly felt that was the niche in the system. People eat yogurt every single day. Um, if they don't eat it, it's going to go bad in their fridge and they're going to have to go back and buy it more. Um, it's the opportunity to really grow and expand. Um, and it's a one-to-one -one match in your product. So you get, um, you get a lot of milk that you get to utilize. And so we started with yogurt. We thought that we were going to just sell it in our state. <laughs> well, first our county. Then we're like, oh, our county's a little too small to support 400 dairy cows. Um, and so then we got, went statewide, and that was still not enough. And so we started March 22. We sold our first cup of yogurt. Um, within the first couple months, we got into local distributors like John F. Martin, then landed giant three months after. We became national after four months, um, and we're in every state by the end of that first year. Um, 2023 was our first calendar year in business, and we produced more than 2.5 million cups of yogurt. That's 2.5 million times we got to get our product into the hands of consumers that are ignorant to where their food comes from, and it's not their fault. Only 2% of our population is directly involved with agriculture. So we have to give them, we have to speak through our products, speak to those retail shelves. Um, we'll connect a little more about that. But yeah, we have an organic skier yogurt and we're the fastest growing yogurt company in the country. We just got Forbes 30 under 30. Um, we sit on the Team PA board, <laughs> which is a really amazing nonpartisan um, board that we get to use our voice. And we're excited to see where we go with that goal of continuing to expand so we can really be stable. This last year, all I've been doing is fundraising. So that's part of the story. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. Hello, everybody. My name is Krista Barfield, um, founder of and CEO of Farmer John. John is J-A-W-N. I always like to clarify that. J <laughs> John is a Philly word for those who, who's familiar with John in here? Okay. Um, for those who are not, John means person, place, or thing. So and is <laughs> it just means anything. So when I was naming my company, it really became a testament and a love story to that anybody can farm. And that's really the message. And if you don't plan on farming, which the majority of our population does not, as you just mentioned, um, you should at least still know who your farmer is and where your food comes from. So to me, that's just a, a human right. And a part of what our jobs are is that consumer education to make sure they understand that is something they should be considering. Um, but ultimately, I'm a healthcare professional first. I'm raised by a healthcare professional. Um, I grew up loving medicine and all things health and worked for some of the top doctors in the world. And in doing so, um, at a very high level, ended up burning myself out. <laughs> and, and once I decided to resign from my job, I actually walked into work on January 2nd, 2018 in management, had 10 employees um, under me, a full C-suite above me, and sat down and read an email from my boss and that was the end of that i resigned all before 8 a.m on that morning gave them three weeks notice and actually took my very first vacation out of the united states had never been anywhere first stamp on my passport to martinique and upon choosing that trip which was solo um everyone thought i was crazy especially that woman over there <laughs> um and I, I do have a family of my own i have two children and so um you know i did what any millennial would do once you quit your job you go on vacation <laughs> and <laughs> by myself and i uh had the the amazing experience of being housed in an Airbnb that I didn't know at the time until I got there was owned by black farmers. 
And those farmers, um, I ended up choosing that country because of my uh, French speaking, French group speaking French because of the school that I attended um, and learning it from fourth grade all the way in so through college and dusty, dusted my French off to go to Martinique and um, had an opportunity to meet these farmers and uh, stayed with them. And because I was by myself and they knew that, um, they were like, hey, do you want to hang out with us today? You know, we'll take you around the island. And so I did. And uh, after we did an exploration of, of that beautiful island, they were like, we have to go to work, but you're welcome to come. And I was like, sure, you know, I'd love to. So upon going to work at that moment, I still didn't know what work was, um, but I went with them. <laughs> I went with them and I had the opportunity of seeing a team of people of all different colors. Um, if you're not familiar, Martinique has a, also Dutch influence as well as French. So there are black and white people that get along in, in a very different way than I've ever seen. And that um, the, the type of social equity is just very different there. It's, the, it's a different type of belonging than there is in America. And they haven't had to deal with the same type of strife um, in the, the more recent years. And so just watching their teams work together and packing boxes of fruits and vegetables and herbs. And at that time, I didn't have the language of CSA. I didn't know what that was um, until I returned back to, to Philadelphia. But watching them pack boxes, and I had the, the distinct opportunity to see uh, again a wealth of people all different colors come and picking up those boxes and I was like wow this is really beautiful like people are, there's a white envelope in each and every box and they're dropping 20 euros in that box and then they're taking it and they're leaving and I was like well, this is really dope like the food just was picked y'all packing it and like people are coming to get it and I'd never seen that before I didn't even know you know that there were farms um, so close to where I grew up and um, upon seeing that and, and having that experience and feeling so welcomed, and, and then I started helping out with the packing of the boxes. You know, I went home after that trip, five days later, after first entering that island, and I was like, I'm gonna be a farmer. <laughs> Again, my mother thought I was nuts. Um, and I was like, I'm going to be a farmer. I am, you know, I'm not going back to school because that's what I thought I was going to do. My degree is in healthcare administration. And because of the level that I worked at, I felt like I could run any practice or open a new one with my mom if I wanted to. Like, had all these different ideas. Maybe I'll go be a physician assistant. And it really settled in that, no, I'm going to become a farmer. And I'm going to take this knowledge that I have in healthcare and understanding how our practice runs. And I'm going to figure out how to run a business. And I'm going to tie it back to what I truly believe that food is medicine. And I'm going to help people understand that. And that was really my first motivation into, into starting Farmer John. And then as I really started to de develop and get into this work, I realized that there were so many barriers. Uh, so many, so many barriers. Just the fact that there were, you know, black people that were brought to this country for the very purpose of growing food and being the, the building blocks of agriculture, quite specifically, exploitatively. And no black people, barely, were actually still involved present day. And I said, we have to change that. I have to see why, why this is. And I started looking at the health aspects of it and the direct correlation that you know, people really don't understand where their food comes from, all people. But then when I look at black people being the, the most unhealthiest population in America, I knew they had a direct correlation to the food that's in our communities. And so that became a part of the mission. And I wanted to find people who had interest in growing food. Like, who looks like me that really wants to be involved in this process, that wants to do more than just urban growing, but wants to really expand the business and grow to scale? And um, what started as an urban ag initiative has now grown from being a 24 square foot greenhouse in my backyard in 2018 when I got off the plane to, to now 128 acres and um, across three counties in PA. And the reason why that was important to me was so that I could go where the people are and be able to grow enough food that I can get it back down into the city and to the surrounding county. So I'm really happy to be a part of this organic movement. Um, for me, organic was all always what it was, uh, you, you know, giving honor to the, the Lenape people and other indigenous tribes, that's how they grew, you know, putting wood ash into mixing into your soil or using leaves in soil. These are not new concepts. You know, they've been around for quite some time. So it's really nice to 
uh, be a part of this agricultural community that loves organic because we all know that there's a wide vast community that does not um, so it's nice to be in good company but what what we've grown thus far and I say we because uh, I have a very small team that I've been able to build over these last six years of entrepreneurship but we do stand on our uh, value-added brands that we're continuing to build because to, to really have a farm that is successful it is important to support it with value-added products um, so we're teaching that as well so because when I got off that plane I didn't see an opportunity to learn how to be a farmer based in Philadelphia didn't see around me how can I grow food and so my instinctively the first thing was like I should just go volunteer so I went to go volunteers at, here at various farms, and um, as you can imagine, I'm sure all of you have probably touched the farm <laughs> at some point, so you know you're weeding or you're packing vegetable bags, and um, for, that's all important, as we all know, it, uh, valuable work, but it doesn't get you to the knit and grit and foundation of knowing how to run a farm operation. And so I just jumped in because I didn't know that a Rodale existed, and I'm not even sure at the time if, if farmer training existed, um, their work program, or you know, I didn't know about process farmer training, which also may not have existed. So I didn't know about farm trainings and I wasn't interested in another four-year degree so you know I just decided to start farming and uh, <laughs> and I did that like I said in a 24 square foot greenhouse in my backyard which is all concrete um, I rigged irrigation on my own I rigged heat on my own and I started to grow herbs and uh, I started a tea company and I got that tea company distributed into various uh, specialty grocery stores in the Philadelphia region and that's how we made our first nut of change so that I could go into actually farming 10 CSA members is how I began farmer John in January 2020 and then uh, COVID hit and gave us an opportunity to have a 40,000 square foot property of just greenhouses and uh, upon being in there for a while we found out that once winter came the greenhouses actually did not have heat and so we moved out of that property and I started to work on a concept that I call corner join corner join is a uh, really really dear to me because it's what I believe a corner store should be it really is a, an embodiment of food as medicine and our first one will open in Kensington section of Philadelphia which is currently where the opioid opioid crisis is present in Philly so there's a lot of change happening while gentrification is also taking place at, at the same time and so it's important for black and brown faces to to see what representation looks like in their food system and so that's why it was important for me to be in that location. Uh, and so after, you know, I hired a farm manager for our locations closer to Philly, once this opportunity came a year and a half ago for the 123 acre property in Chester County. And so now I primarily reside in Chester County where we're getting that off the ground and, uh, yeah, it's been it's been an adventure to say the least, but it's really beautiful to, to know that once we are finally uh, certified organic, which we're almost there, working with Rodale and and uh, through PCL, will be um, one of the largest, if not the largest, regenerative organic black-owned farm in the whole entire nation. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> That's, <laughs> I don't know how I can um, make me feel just like a dirt farmer, but we all know it's not <laughs> dirt. Um, so we uh, work for a, a family farm up in uh, Northumberland County. Um, it was based, it's like, um, I think the fifth generation is running around there now. But the big thing for me when I went to work for them 40 years ago was no-till, and I came from a background we mow boarded everything um, it was a soil conservation aspect that that we strive to do um, and when when the higher-ups came and said I think we should try some organic I, I really hung my head because to me organic was weeds it was tillage there was a lot of things there that didn't make a lot of sense um, because you know in college I had a buddy that was talking about being organic and we always harassed him too um, but at any rate that's mainline agriculture and, and what we know 
is that a lot of times there's a compaction layer here. You've got to open your mind up and see what's there. Um, so the family that has Cotner Farms also owns a processing plant. I don't know, shouldn't be, unless... Oh, no, I don't, I don't do it. Yeah, no, I don't have anything. <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, the, the fourth generation came back and there was no, not, not a lot of room for them at the farm. So they, they kind of shot off in a different, different thing and uh, came up with the idea of extruding soybean meal. So that led to the establishment of, of Boyd Station. Um, Boyd Station may be one of the largest organic feed processors in the nation. I know they supply all the organic soybean meal to Bell and Evans, um, as well as other things. They supply organic oils all over the place um, for salad and, and uh, food grade. So it kind of reflects down on us that we should be kind of heading in that direction with the leadership saying, you know, this is what we're doing. You guys should follow along. So we picked it up um, and started to run with it. Well, walk. Um, because our concern was how do we do this without tillage, you know, because of the soil. I mean, that's been the history there at the farm. I mean, there's been a couple of uh, folks there recognized by the county for being Conservation Farmer of the Year. Um, Don Sr. was up for a National Soil and Water Award. So there's, there's a lot of it there. Um, so that's how we've approached it. Things haven't necessarily worked out in that direction. But that's what we're looking for. We're still on a learning curve. Um, I think for my own, own self, it has led to a little more fun in the farming and another set of knowledge to have, to learn, to experiment with. Um, so we've gone from, well, we've had two years of certified organic. Um, the first year, we tried uh, no-till soybeans. And Sam kind of has been around, kind of, we've talked to him a few times about it um, and on the conventional side we are big into cover crops but what what the connection with the organics and where we had started to go on the conventional side has allowed us to get more on this regen agriculture thing and with the organics the history we had of layer manure because that was the main thing with the farm we had like 450,000 layers and made our own feed market our own eggs um, we had lots of manure, and for a while back, before a lot of the legislation came in, it was something we had to get rid of. So it got it got applied overly, and so our phosphorus levels are up. So now everyone knows that nitrogen is a need for the crops, and so that's one been one of our bigger challenges is to learn to grow nitrogen. And it's interesting with the folks that we've rubbed elbows with. Um, we're, well, we're leaving the first of the month to go to O'Grain's conference out in Wisconsin, and there's a whole, a whole community out there that we can learn from. Um, that's been our biggest thing. But we've, we've been through some challenges, and, and one of them that I'd like to talk about, you know, you'll hear a little bit about later is, you know, with the organics, to do what we need to do in the true organic fashion is have at least a five-year rotation. And the market for the organic crops on a on a scale you know just being a row crop farmer is what do we do with small grains um so that's something that i'll probably touch on later but we've we've had some good experiences we've learned ways around it and and the one thing that we've got going and it's always been my concern with the tillage are we going to be losing our organic matter because we've no-tilled for all oh, a lot of the farms have been 30 years without any tillage. And what are we going to do with, with that soil structure? How, are we going to destroy that? And so we've, we've approached it from that manner, trying to preserve that and, and incorporate the cover crops in everything to keep that soil covered so it's, it's there for us. Um, 
So, but but we've started with soybeans. Um, we're not real big on corn, but we started the new uh, sunflowers for the first time this year. Um, I don't know if it was a bigger hit for us or for the neighborhood because it was just everybody just loved them. Um, there was only a couple that got cut too. They were pretty respectful, but um, so that's that's kind of our our story and where we've been and where we want to go. Um, conserve the soil, build the organic matter. Um, we're involved in PASA's soil health studies. So we've got something we can track. There was one field, one of our better fields, that we pulled samples on prior to starting transition. So we're going to be able to track that right on through to see where we end up at. So we're at 200 acres there between transition and, and certified, and we're kind of took a year off from transitioning anymore to get a handle on what all this means. We're, we're big at tracking all of our expenses and our costs and every pass we make in the field. Um, so to see where it all, where it all takes us. All right, I have more questions, but I'm gonna open it up to all of you guys first um, because we, uh, we have a, well, about 20 minutes more for the program, and then, um, like I shared, you're welcome to stick around. We have the room reserved until 3.30. We still have some refreshments there, and including the Painterland Sisters yogurt. So um, any, uh, I'm gonna try to get your questions on the microphone, either you know, to have you do it directly, or I'll repeat them. So um, do we have some questions and comments from the audience? If not, I can keep asking questions. <laughs> there you go. Hi. <laughs> this is a big question. <laughs> um, so maybe for you, Gina. The, um, I'm thinking about school food. What would be the economic benefit for Pennsylvania to give incentives for school food to be certified organic as well. So when you think about food as medicine and you think about some of our most vulnerable populations, what I'd be curious just to see, like, I mean, it's a billion dollar industry. If we were to move to certified organic and make the reimbursements to reflect that since the cost is kind of what's scaring a lot of folks away. That is a great question, and it is a big one to answer right here. <laughs> so um, I'm going to um, partially answer and partially say, like, we'd have to study it more, right? Um, so I think the first thing is um, we would have to kind of understand how does that increase from an, so from an economic impact standpoint, how does that, just from, like, the pure numbers, what does that do to overall um, demand and and how and and so what does that look like in terms of increasing sales um, you know, I don't think that we dug into like what the overall market of um, of kind of school purchases for food is in the Commonwealth but I that's like that like there's like a very logical like approach you could take to figuring out this the kind of like hypothetical impact right like what is the overall um, purchasing of f for food in schools what does that look like if it's 20% organic, 50, 100%, uh, and then we'd have to kind of think about like what, like how much can um, farms in Pennsylvania uh, actually meet that demand and how much would it come from elsewhere? And that's okay too, right? Because it's still increasing the overall kind of market in, in the state. So that's one piece to it. Um, but something else that, um, that I would think we would need to look at in terms of economic impact is the public health impacts. Now, I'm not a public health researcher. We, when we do work that thinks about um, the impact on like these br on broader impact on broader categories such as say like mental health public health etc we usually draw on on um, you know academic research um, I would imagine there have been studies that kind of and Chris that you might actually know about this since you come from a public health background um, <coughs> might we would want to like look at like what is the kind of um, health impacts in terms of, you know, maybe fewer doctor's visits, longer um, longer lifespans, um, fewer, you know, medical costs, things like that. Um, I think that it would probably be pretty significant, especially statewide, but 
Oh, that's a big question that uh, I, I'd, I'd love to talk and, and think more about how we might look at that. I'll just, I'll just add to that that is, there is a lot of data that already exists. Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Thank you. There's a lot of data that currently already exists. Um, the food is medicine that ever since the Health, Hunger, and Nutrition Summit, um, Health, Nutrition, and Hunger Summit took place from the Biden-Harris administration last fall, we actually were on the road for a lot of those regional summits around the country talking about our work and how we approach it. And I have a, a very farm-first approach when it comes to food as medicine, whereas uh, the rest of the 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 healthcare world, the public uh, health sector, is really looking at it from a um, clinician first approach, which we already know doesn't work. And so, a lot of the conversations that I've had um, traveling around the country talking about this um, with uh, the USCA and the Root Cause Coalition, we really are just digging into the fact that we can't do it the way that we've already been doing it and expect a different result. Um, so yes, to answer your question, there's so much data, but when it comes to the food getting into schools, that's only one thing that we're discussing. We're also talking about um, payers paying, uh, help insurance payers also paying for the food and trying to get insurance payers to pay farmers uh, as well is as a distributor um, produce prescriptions is a very big topic right now and uh, and that's what we're really trying to get rolled out so that's why I love like both of my passions being able to come together in health health care and now farming um, but produce prescriptions and um, just diet related disease is so huge in vulnerable populations but also across our entire country every population everybody is impacted by that so it would make sense that if we can work with nutrition nutritionists and dietitians to be able to design um, plans, you know, have a, a produce prescription that you write, take it to your local corner joint, and you get your produce and understand what your recipes are for that week. Or if your meals are already prepared, there's tons of companies that do that as well. And then be able to see that the, you know, the cholesterol, the high blood pressure, the diabetes has definitely improved. Um, so th the studies are there. It's just about taking it and, and saying, like, all right, look at this and, like, you know, buy food from farmers, buy organic. And I love the idea of schools going and saying, like, hey, we're only going to buy organic. That makes so much sense for them to go first. Yeah. Um, this is swinging in the back from what is really a vital topic of the healthiness of the food, but also to the production. Um, I had a chance to have a first time in a long time a uh, dinner with a commodity organic egg scale, you know, 20, 30,000 bird layers. And I was stunned to hear that he makes 27 cents a dozen for those organic eggs, which makes that very possible to put them into the schools for one thing. <laughs> but I'm just curious for all three of you, where is the price point in the returns is in the market as you're looking at? And is that potentially a limiting factor for seeing more farmers move into organic systems, whether it is on uh, the Farmer John scale, which is trying to do the corner store in that market, versus even as, as at the bigger farm scale. I mean, I think this is really was a surprise for me to learn that number. I'd love to start this off and pair it with some of my opinions on organic and why I'm really excited to be here. Um, it's a conversation that we all get to have, and I think there's so many different opinions about organic. And I think coming about it in a positive way and not being so rigid about this is organic and this is conventional. Pennsylvania farmers are some of the most organic farmers throughout our country. If you just look at the resources that we have, with running water and um, the ability to graze, the need to graze, um, a lot of conventional farmers grazing and working together, the ability to have rural areas and big cities um, and have more farmers in a uh, urban area than any other state. And so to start it off, um, it's I thought that being a brand would be the answer <laughs> um, organic was never an the answer it was like if I'm a brand I can really be that voice and now that we've created this national company um, we're nowhere near profitable we're projected to hit it in 2025 99% of new food brands go out of business 99% I don't know if I would have started this if I knew that. 
but I'm glad I did because we have we have this really unique perspective um, that really can help everyone in this room figure out how can Pennsylvania progress this forward so that the challenges we're having, we can open this door and this network for other people. And the number one thing is, yeah, I'm not getting enough money for my yogurt on shelves. Um, the stores are limiting what I can sell it for. Um, they wanted my yogurts to be under $2 a container. That's four cups of milk in every single one of those cups of yogurt. Yet the um, other alternative milk yogurts are commonly at 350 on average. So we pushed back, and we're now selling it for 299 to 350 in stores, and we really need to be at four dollars a container. And so when I look at organic and like the this organic movement that we're talking about, I really um, the thing I'm pushing the most now is all these grants and opportunities how does it connect with the whole system um, and the different farmers that are in it so that we can rise together um, so what's best for the farmer what's best for the processor what's best for the brand and how does that affect the consumer and lying it all together and thinking about each opportunity as like we're in it together um, like Farm Bureau and PASA like sometimes some of your viewpoints are so different but coming together it could be really amazing for this organic movement um, and one of the biggest things is how do we get new brands so that we can support those processing plants so that those processing plants can keep processing pennsylvania products and when i was just a farmer i was like oh, if i'm a brand i got it now i'm a brand and i'm like i need your help so that i can stay in business so i can be funded Funding is one of the options uh, because I get so little for my product. Um, even you know, I produce 2.5 million, and each cup of yogurt, I think we make, I don't know, 16 cents off of it. Um, and so we're making sure we pay the farmers enough, but we can drive prices up on shelves. I'm getting first-hand experience that we can raise those prices. We need the support on retail shelves because retail shelves, when they go to grocery stores, when they go to the corner store, when they go to the CSAs, those are the first line of defense to talk to consumers. And then marketing on social media, that's second. That's just awareness. How do we get marketing on store shelves for programs like PA for Preferred, like PA Pennsylvania Organic Preferred, and then getting that like structured so we can boost it up, and then network so if other brands want to come in, maybe they're from New York, and they're like, you know what, I want to start a food brand. Where can I go? Come to Pennsylvania. We have processors, we have farmers, and we want to push it together, and we'll support you with connecting you with retail stores, connecting you with all these things. So it's really this this connection of all the great work each individual organization's doing um, and so yeah we don't make enough money and that's something we have to we have to push for and we can there's room to push for on grocery store shelves and consumers are wanting a nutrient dense product and then the work that the USDA is putting in to help provide in the state for these food banks to get our products so when people can't afford it our, our Pennsylvania state's like, you know what? We'll pay Painter Man Sisters. We'll pay these farmers for their products so that the other consumers who can't afford at retail shelves can still get this nutrient-dense food. And so there's all these loopholes to raise the price a little bit and to have, have that opportunity to pay those farmers more and to pay these brands more. I just want to add to that a little bit. Um, that. I believe that or all farmers just deserve to be paid, especially organic farmers, because of uh, the, how intense, uh, intensified the farming process is for us. But at, at the same time, what has to happen, I do think about um, people that can afford it and the people that can't, and then maybe the, the bank stepping in to assist. But there still is that middle. There's those middle people who, uh, I mean, and that's how I grew up, you know, being not being able to always have every single, every single thing, you know, that you want it from the grocery store. Um, so it really depends. And also how I raise my kids, like you may not be able to buy all the, the best things. And it's just true. Like when you really look at the way that um, SNAP benefits are set up, you know, your people that have less refrigerators are fuller than the people that have that that have full time 40 hour jobs. And so because that is a fact, you know, I'm really wanting to see 
it makes sense for that population as well. And um, the SNAP benefits that are also available, I do believe that organic food, because they are typically the most vulnerable population, they should also, um, we have to see the dollars increase for them too. That just has to happen. If we're gonna increase the prices of food that is organic, it has to be accessible for them. Um, and again, awareness, understanding like, the customer has to be aware, the consumer has to be educated on why this is better for them um, because of who they are and how, you know where they come from. Um, but we also just really need to look out for that middle, that middle as well. And I just don't want them to be forgotten because that I am them and many of you are as well. Not yet. <laughs> I don't want to miss it. It won't be much <laughs> after you listen to these guys. I'm curious about your dairy and how long it's been organic. And was that part of your strategy in changing your product? Was it becoming organic or was that historical? We became organic in 2003, and it was one of the fastest transitions, apparently. Um, and I always ask my grandma, like, why? My grandpa since passed away, but he was a big factor into why they switched. And they always said, well, we didn't have enough money to buy chemicals or anything else. We had land to graze. Being a poor farmer, organic is sometimes the best answer because you have to work with the land, right? Um, and so that was his answer. So we switched to organic, and we practically been doing organic practices way before that certified organic. That because we're helping farmers transition to organic with this program that Kristen talked about at Team Ag. And the first cluster of them, um, there were six. Five of them had already been practicing organic practices for 20 plus years. And they just hadn't become certified. So I think there are a lot of people that are sitting on that edge that could easily push right into becoming certified organic. That really took me by surprise. It is amazing. And um, with this organic you know, excellence, I'm really excited to support all of certified and not certified and kind of moving that way. And like, you know, sometimes it is a little more difficult or it is what you said, like the gap between like just understanding and being open-minded. but to have that like bridge way to support all of them to get them gradually to move over is really important. Hi there. Uh, this might be a question for you, kind of banking off your um, statement. What incentives do farmers have to go <coughs> organic if it's so hard and there's so many like things you have to go through? What, what's the big incentive to go that way? What are the barriers that were keeping them from doing it? And um, I'm finding that one of the issues is the paperwork. Um, also, so many farmers sell direct now. They don't feel the need of the farmers that I'm working with. They didn't feel the need to become certified because they were direct marketing. But as they grow and they move beyond what they're going to sell direct to, there's more of an incentive to show that certification if they're not having that one-to-one -one relationship. Building off the question earlier about schools and getting food into schools that is certified organic, what has been the thought or the push through this program to look into the WIC program and things to not just start when children become school age, but giving that advantage to newborn children and mothers who are nursing and those things, because it wasn't that long ago, and I may be incorrect, those WIC checks could not be used for certified organic milk. So what is the, what is the thought or looking into, there's something simple that you could use to get that organic product into those that need it? <laughs> so USDA actually has evolved their rules on that and, and it was the US Department of Agriculture that was precluding the inclusion of organics in the WIC program as a cost savings measure. 
Um, but they've changed their minds on that, and they do now allow states to, to offer organic foods in their state market baskets that are available to WIC. So it's a matter now. I, I, so I, Pennsylvania is not one of the states that allows that, am I correct? Uh, we, we, we do in some areas and not in others. It, it is the Department of uh, Human Services that we need to, to talk to about getting a little more engaged, and that will be something we can hopefully do through the Center of, of Excellence. It's, it's yes on fruits and vegetables. I don't think we're there yet on dairy. So. don't disagree at all. U USDA is this mammoth agency with 17 distinct agencies. The Agricultural Marketing Service runs the National Organic Program. The Food and Nutrition Service runs the WIC program. Some of my 14 years at USDA was spent simply running back and forth across 14th and Independence trying to get people to talk to each other. And this is, I think, one of those cases where a couple more conversations, but particularly with the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services with us, will we'll help make that happen. Especially if we maybe have the support of, you know, younger people out there that have started a program with produce and something with dairy would be wonderful if we got some support. Thank you. We're, we're going to start wrapping things up, and I think um, it'd be good to keep the conversation going for those of you who can stick around. And please do fill out your evaluation form and turn it into me or, or put it on the table up here. Um, but first, I wanted to introduce K Katie McLaughlin from the Office of the Governor, um, just to hear some of her remarks. And then Cheryl is, is going to offer the closing, closing remarks. Thank you, Katie. Sure. Thank you, Kristen. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Well, on behalf on the, the Shapiro administration, I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all of you. Um, each of you are so critical to what we're doing here throughout the Commonwealth. Um, and as we look at organic, particularly through the supply chain, we know there's a lot of moving parts. We know we have a lot to do. And it's our hope that the Office of Transformation and Opportunity will be a part of that solution. Uh, transformation and Opportunity, when I told my grandpa this is the office I was going to, he saw he said that sounds like a, like a makeover show. <laughs> He's not necessarily wrong. In a way, we are trying to make over, in a sense, how we do business here in Pennsylvania. And we know that comes in a lot of different shapes and a lot of different sizes. But we do see it for agriculture in particular, that organic is absolutely a tool to make us more competitive in the market. Um, so we're here. We're so excited um, to be a part of this. We're excited about the Organic Center for Excellence. We know there's more work to be done. So just, again, thank you so much and really honored to be here. Um, me again. So <laughs> thank you all for, for joining us again this year. I'm pretty sure we're doing this again next year. So mark your calendars for the 2025 Farm Show. Uh, I want to just note with, with a special thanks to Jeff Warner for coming in. Jeff is the director of our Bureau of Food Safety. And as we all know, consumer confidence in organic being what we say it is, is, is essential to maintaining the kind of growth in the marketplace. Uh, having our food lab available to, to help us uh, make sure that we're telling the truth and, and when people who want to market that they've been tested by the Department of Agriculture want to add that to their packaging, I think we're going to see more of that coming out in the future. Some of you have probably bought boxes of cookies and crackers that said on the side, regulated by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. That's actually no longer required by law, but people still do it because it's sort of a good housekeeping seal of approval. Uh, it goes back to a 1931 bakery law. Uh, I think we can get to the same place in, in organics that you know, being from Pennsylvania means something just a little more uh, because we have uh, this level of, of consumer confidence that Jeff and his team can bring to the table. So I'm, I'm thrilled to have it. I, I was complaining about USDA before. 
sometimes the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture gets a little siloed and we don't always talk to each other the way we should and the center of excellence concept is letting all of those kind of walls break down and, and it's great. It's, it's just one more thing to look forward to. So uh, thank you again to the panelists. That was fantastic. Haley, thank you for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I love the blueberry lemon. It's my favorite flavor. It's like, yes, we got blueberry lemon up here. Um, but thank you all again. Enjoy the rest of the farm show and uh, a ride home that is not in torrential rain or snow. So thank you all.